Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this lecture hosted by the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society. My name is Mark Pennington and I'm the director of the Centre. The lecture this evening is part of our ongoing series on the political economy of knowledge and ignorance. One of the themes that we've been exploring in that series is the relationship between power, knowledge and political authority. What does it mean to govern in a context where there is no one centre of decision-making power when there is no one set of levers that can be pulled to secure a particular result. This is a question at the heart of what the French social theorist Michel Foucault referred to as governmentality. It's in that context that I'm truly delighted that we have a, with us this evening one of the world's foremost thinkers on the concepts of government and governmentality. Professor Mitchell Dean is a political and historical sociologist and is professor of public governance at the Copenhagen Business School, where he's been head of department since 2019. Prior to that, he held positions at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, and at the University of Newcastle. I have to say that I've personally learned an enormous amount from reading Mitchell's work on Foucault in particular, and I would single out three works. His remarkable work on governmentality, power and rule in modern society, the book State Phobia, and Civil Society, The Political Legacy of Michel Foucault, written with Caspar Villadsen, and the deliciously entitled The Last Man Takes LSD, Foucault and the End of Revolution, written with Daniel Zamora. This evening, he's gonna to speak to us on governing societies after governmentality, order, glory, and sovereignty. Please welcome Professor Mitchell Dean. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much. And thank you for the invitation. Um, I'll re uh, it doesn't take much for me to reveal my age, but I'll say that when I was recently reading a, a book by Bob Dylan called The Philosophy of the Modern Song, he said, there are plenty of places that call you up. Uh, and uh, you can say, I'll take that call later. But when London's calling, you come. And uh, that's, uh, that, that uh, was my uh, response to, to Mark's uh, in invitation. In fact, the last time I was in London and spoke in London uh, was at, uh, on the 30th anniversary of Foucault's death. And I spoke in the British Library, a, a paper called uh, uh, Michel Foucault's Apology for Neoliberalism. And that seemed to lead to all sorts of directions, including towards the last man takes LSD. Um, but I'm not really going to do a very normative uh, talk today. I'm basically going to take you through some of my, um, I guess, sort of analytical thinking, because I'm one of these people who knows sooner that I feel like I've conquered something or understood something that I've become immediately critical of it. And, uh, and, and so I've never been a particularly faithful Foucauldian in that sense. And, uh, and, I, and, uh, and so what I'm going to take you through fairly quickly, hopefully, um, is the uh, firstly, uh, this framework for thinking about government and power that I that I um, and others derived from from Foucault, um, and then to then to some of the kind of beats uh, I guess that uh, that I would say were after governmentality. So that governing society is part of the title. Well, that was homage to to my the Centre for for Governance and Society and the the invite, but the after governmentality is really no sooner had I in some way elaborated what I thought was a kind of overview of, of the governmentality framework, then I became critical of it as well. So order, glory, and sovereignty, these are kind of parts of that. Uh, parts of that. And, and simply because I'm, I'm uh, genuinely a shy person, um, I'm wanting to remind myself that I am prepared for this lecture that I have written uh, some books around Foucault, around governmentality, the Constitution of Poverty is my PhD thesis, uh, and I'm just for just for fun flicking them up there. Um, that's not everything. <laughs> uh, and so the lecture will be uh, simply just a review of uh, Foucault and governmentality, some of my questioning, some of my kind of historical questioning of, of it. Uh, uh, that's going back to immediately after 
The governmentality book was published in 1999. Uh, from, from the moment it was published, I was writing stuff that was kind of critical of Foucault and governmentality. So it's not, it's not new. Then um, just uh, this a notion of signature of power when I sought to go back to the drawing board, as I put it there, and rethink the, some of these problematics around power and then some more recent developments. So that's, uh, that's what you're in for in the next 50 minutes. And uh, if I, then I, so the first part, a bit of a revision of Foucault, and I'm sure, so I can go quickly through this, I'm sure this is going to be very familiar to people. What problem did Foucault respond to in his theory of power? So I put uh, the Leviathan up there, uh, the frontispiece from the 1651 Hobbes book uh, that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, the epigraph, if that's the right word at the top, says there is no power on earth that can be compared uh, to him. From the book of Job, and we see the kind of monster uh, appearing above the, above the, above the town. And with the symbols, the kind of political theological symbols there, the sword and uh, uh, the crozier, I think that's called, and uh, people like um, Quentin Skinner and uh, Giorgio Agamben could do a better job at explaining all the symbols of that than I will, so I won't uh, go into that side of things. But, in, but Foucault's formulations about what he was trying to do in some ways position him very much as a kind of anti-Leviathan, but also um, pitches himself against a thinker who we would recognize today as m the most sort of uh, focused on the question of appropriation, of seizure, of taking away as fundamental to power. And that would be Carl Schmitt. And uh, so a couple of quotes I have from Foucault and not necessarily a direct relationship to Schmidt, that this conception of power that he's opposing um, uh, focuses on the right of seizure of things, time, bodies, and ultimately life itself. Um, uh, the discourse that he's contesting is bound up with a form of power that is exercised over the land. It concerns powers, displacement, and appropriation of goods and wealth. And this is what Foucault wants to put to one side. And in the mid-70s, uh, of course, many times, he said we need to cut off the king's head. In political theory, that's still to be done. And there's a couple of other versions of that there. So whether or not he's an anti-state thinker, he's certainly an anti-sovereignty thinker. Um, and whether he was a normatively an anti-state thinker is perhaps another matter. And I think some of the subtleties and ambiguities of the book we did on state phobia are perhaps uh, passed by some of, some of our reviewers. But uh, it's, a, it's certainly a degree of ambiguity. And he does, in the most famous governmentality lecture, the one that was published well in advance of the, all of the, uh, all the translated series, he talks about the overvaluation of the problem of the state and it taking two forms, one of which is this uh, monstrous form, the cold monster, um, and the other is reducing it to a set of functions, reproducing uh, relations of production and productive forces. The reference, of course, is, is to structural Marxism there. Um, uh, but it's also to the, uh, an idea that is found in Hobbes, which is the idea of the state as a kind of machine, not only a monster, not only a, gr a, a, a great man, this figure, but also a machine. And so he says that of the state, um, doubtless no more today than the past, it does not have this unity, individuality, and rigorous functionality. And in words that echo a quote that I've found from a very different thinker, Friedrich Hayek, who says the state is a metaphysically charged term, he says, maybe the state is only a composite reality and a mythicized abstraction whose importance is much less than we think. So, but is he cutting off another head? And certainly to those who have uh, want to position or think of Foucault as a kind of radical 
thinker, the radical of the left type of thinker. He's certainly someone who comes up with quite a, a number of pronouncements that suggest that he's very he's strongly uh, uh, opposed to uh, not only not only uh, dialectical materialism, but as he puts it in this moder moderately titled or immoderately titled uh, uh, interview, torture is reason. Um, every that um, what must be called into question is everything this socialist tradition has produced uh, historically must be condemned. So it's a fairly strong statement. And I don't know whether I have something else. In Japan, around about the same time, Marxism at present finds itself in an undeniable crisis, the crisis of Western thought, of the Western concept, which is revolution, uh, the crisis of the Western concept of man and society. And you could really compose a whole series of very strong rejections of not only socialism, but social democratic traditions of, of, um, uh, of, of uh, uh, Marxism as, a, I guess, a political practice um, from his work. Uh, for example, he says that it's, it, he points out its relationship to racism when it emphasizes the class struggle. It is necessarily, he says, uh, racist. He talks about the fraternal relations, the two pathologies of power of national socialism and Soviet socialism. And importantly, he says that there is no such thing as a, an autonomous socialist governmentality. So he kind of wipes out the welfare state tradition, maybe the Swedish social democratic tradition, Scandinavian social democratic tradition with that kind of statement. Um, so he's quite politically and, and in some degree intellectually hostile to both Marxist and socialist traditions. Um, in contrast, he jokes that uh, about the president discard de Stang's uh, ref prison reforms of the time that um, the, the latter had sought an anti-repressive society. Well, I, didn't, I didn't want to get too far into this, uh, this contextual history stuff. So he's against, as you know, this uh, judicial political theory of sovereignty. His first step is uh, elaborating a microphysics of power, focusing on the capillary. This is an organic corporeal metaphor, um, manifestations of power and not its centralized version. Power is productive rather than repressive. It works on the body, you know, discipline and punish. But I think perhaps the most um, innovative or creative um, part of the, his uh, work is to say that what it is productive of is, this, is of subjects. And this idea of assujettissement, subjectification, which is about both subjection as in domination and subjectification as in the formation of, of subjects. So we are obliged to acknowledge the truth of ourselves. Uh, power elicits our, concession, our confession about what we're thought to have repressed. And he positions this in a kind of history of what he calls Western Christian culture. And I've got the, uh, the, the confessional, a very stylish Northern Italian confessional uh, booth there to, uh, to, to, to represent that. Um, he moves to government, governmentality. Now he has a much, he seems to bring this notion of freedom into the picture much more than, than his earlier work. Uh, power works through free subject. Sometimes he describes it as the action upon the action of others. Um, and one small, or even a strategic game between liberties. So he talks about how even friendship relations have power. The fact that you might try to influence your friends to where you're going out on the weekend or something like that. There's a power game involved in that. Um, but within this larger kind of picture of power, uh, he carves out this idea of government. And I, I don't think it's anywhere made explicit. But I would say that government is a kind of rational and reflected subset of these power 
relations that aims at strategically at particular objectives, uses more elaborated forms of uh, discourse and knowledge in, in order to achieve its ends. Um, so you might ask, where does this leave domination and violence? Um, certainly violence is central to many, many ways of thinking about power and the Weberian definition of the state. Domination, he, he thinks of as a kind of ossification and fixing of these power relations. Freedom, so it's not an intrinsic quality, it's not a, not necessarily, it's, it's not over-specified in Foucault, and it may well be quite close to a negative uh, conception of liberty, um, but it's something that might be shaped through action on the environment, that's uh, the first part of it. It always contains the possibility of acting otherwise. And, the, and therefore, it's a source of resistance or counterconduct. So that's fairly minimal. It's Paul Patton, uh, another Australian political philosopher, uh, talked about a, a thin conception of the subject. And so this is the thin conception. But because of the supposition of freedom, the supposition that it's always possible, even in relations of domination, to act otherwise. Uh, it contains the possibility of accounting for forms of resistance as counterconduct. I'm sure you know all of this, so I'm, I'm, I'm going quite quickly. The next slide. Um, Another Australian colleague, Jessica White, who's written about Hayek and, and Foucault, um, that uh, some people would know, um, suggests that Foucault is, offers a critique of the state as an anti-state anti anti thinker, but not an anti-political thinker. And I would perhaps try to nudge a bit further in that direction because um, her, <clears throat> her argument is that he talks about critique as this art of voluntary insubordination. So as if you have a kind of a trajectory of governmentalization, the development of government, you also have a, a trajectory of critique. And it's this, so it's this moment of constant resistance, if you like, or constant contestation. And she therefore says he may be anti-state, but he's not really anti-political. But at the same time, he's capable of pronouncements like the one below, which suggests that he's very sceptical of conventional forms of politics, of formal politics, this politics that, of interest intermediation and, and, and uh, that we know through parliaments and parties and so on. So if he, if he um, is not anti-political, he's cert certainly anti the formal politics. Um, as he found, finds them in, in, um, in France at that time. And so the last slide, in the, these governmentality lectures, he does provide us with a phrase which was a kind of, for me, a, a little bit of an open door and for other people, um, where he's, he talks about population. As you know, population is the object of biopolitics in Foucault and so on. And he says... Um, the more I spoke about population, the more I stopped saying sovereign. Uh, the modern political problem, the privilege that government begins to, to exercise, to the extent that it will be possible one day to say the king reigns but does not govern. And that's something a number of people have thought about, that, that phrase, as somehow different from this cutting off of the king's head, because it seems to simultaneously, at least, affirm the possibility that there is a kind of relationship between a transcendent, supreme form of power within a domain, sovereignty, and governing, um, and that these might be kind of different spheres. Uh, okay, so I think we're getting to... This is, a, this is more my historical questioning of this framework. Right, so. From the early 2000s, you begin to have the whole discourse on states of exception, the uh, framework of sovereignty, the 9-11, the, uh, the Guantanamo Bay, all of that kind of thing. Um, so the first question there is, can, 
can contemporary government or governmentality be characterised as fundamentally about governing through freedom? Looking at the treatment of welfare recipients, for example, in Australia at that time, I kept thinking about the, there's governing through obligation, there's governing through habit, there's governing through discipline, there's governing through shame, there's governing through affect of one type or another. Why privilege this idea of governing through freedom? Similarly, there's often a division of population. Uh, sorry, a, a, um, a, 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 um, there's definitely a division of populations according to the capacity to exercise rational autonomy or freedom or whatever one wants to, to call it. So that kind of composition of, of populations. But, but the second way in which um, there's a kind of illiberality in, in, um, in liberalism and liberal ways of governing would be the way in which norms are generated from notions of civil society and community that are thought to be the norms of the good citizen, the proper parent, etc. And, and these become norms which are, in a sense, imposed upon those who choose to act otherwise, if you like. So, in, so the first part of that is the illiberality within liberal ways of governing, but it's also the liberalism in authoritarian ways of governing. So any kind of history of, say, either uh, forms of totalitarian or authoritarian rule in Germany, I learnt while I was there earlier this year, would have to take into account the participation, the free participation of masses of the population in, in these regimes, the use of market actors, the use of different ways of acting on the actions of others and so on. So this opposition between liberal and authoritarian or the, even the characterization of the current moment as principally a liberal or advanced liberal or neoliberal was something I, a uh, form of governing was something I wanted to, to question. And again, there's a, um, I mean, there's that very nice quote where from, from Hayek who says, it is at least possible in principle that a democratic government may be totalitarian and that an authoritarian government may, might act on liberal principles. Um, which, uh, so that was the first point, was the kind of discussion, oh, sorry. Forgot this. Forgot the slide. So the first first point was really this questioning this power working through freedom, the illiberality of liberalism, and also the kind of liberalism within authoritarian rule. Yeah. The second one um, is a lot of this kind of uh, literature began to talk about. So the governmentality literature uh, uh, develops. What's the relationship between this newfound governmentality framework and all of the other types of forms of power that Foucault had elaborated, biopolitics, discipline, and so on? Um, and occasionally, and I'm not exactly sure where I picked this up, I think it might be in Powers of Freedom, um, Nicholas Rose's book uh, that came out at that time, this, the idea of a reinscription thesis, the idea that somehow governmentality repositions and relocates all of these other forms of power within it and, and, there, and transforms them. Um, so, partic so in my case, I particularly want to question this um, as far as sovereignty is concerned. And the bipolar and binary, there's a paper out in Economy and Society uh, in the last few weeks that talks about contesting Foucault's binaries. It's a very good paper, but those binaries have been contested for about 40 years now. Um, but where, but whether sovereignty, whether all the questions around consent and legitimacy and legitimation, around public opinion, uh, around forced violence decision, what happens to them? Do they just drop out of the picture? Um, so that was the second one. And I'm not saying these are entirely fair criticisms, but they're criticisms that that of that kind of moment uh, that were, were, were actually posed very much by this kind of uh, uh, you know, war on terror, Guantanamo Bay moment, uh, uh, and that governmentality couldn't contain. So the kind of optimistic vision of power that governmentality in a way represented was very much 
this kind of Fukuyama type of moment of the 1990s of globalization, of cosmopolitanism, and so on, suddenly uh, it's being called into question. So the third one. So is, liber is governmentality just another name for liberal governing? Uh, so what have I got there? So there seemed to me a conflation in the description of liberalism in the governmentality literature um, with sort of liberal self-understanding um, in the sense that Foucault thinks of, of, of liberalism as a critique of too much governing that works through freedom. How far is this from a kind of classical liberal notion that liberalism is a limited government that respects individual freedom? So the conceptual kind of elisions there between liberalism as is thought through liberal discourse and Foucault's understanding of it seemed to me quite strong. Um, are there only liberal and neoliberal forms of governmentality? Is there a kind of teleology of this story of these narratives of governmentality? I mentioned there was no autonomous socialist governmentality. So socialists are faced with a choice. They can either be adopt neoliberal technologies of government, according to Foucault, or these more residual categories that he sometimes alludes to, the governmentality of the party, governmentalities of the police state. Is there, so the questioning was, is there an implicit normativity in this kind of framework? It claimed to be a kind of value neutral. Maybe people could correct me and say that's not the case, but I, that's certainly the claim in first generation of governmentality Scholars kind of value neutral, bracketed off normativity in some, in some way, but here it seemed that there, to me any, at least, that there was a kind of implicit normativity there. And the final one was, how do we make sense of the history of forms of, of, of power in government? And Foucault shifts around here. I know he's a philosopher. I'm probably looking at it from a kind of historical sociological point of view or political sociological point of view. There's a linear story that he tells in terms of a kind of meta-narrative, which is, starts off as a binary between sovereignty and modern forms, and then perhaps is attenuated through sovereignty, discipline, and biopolitics. Then he becomes uh, somehow maybe a little bit embarrassed by that, uh, by that kind of narrative that he's given. And the kind of focus on Western modernity, the threshold of Western modernity that he talks about, and he starts talking about dispositives and sets off a whole chain of thinking, uh, which we might call post-structuralism, that thinks in terms of actor networks, assemblages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These all of these are kind of uh, very similar thought figures, um, but, uh, some, something that has heterogeneous elements. Um, uh, has a strategic direction and so on. A dispositive is a, a French word for machine, if you like, a kind of a assemblage of, of, of technical elements. But, and then he, he sort of presents sometimes a kind of complexity theory, if you like, that this complex relation between these different dispositives. It's not the, it's not the uh, linear development of one after the other. And um, security, discipline, and law, stroke sovereignty, these different dispositives somehow enter into these complex systems of correlation, structures of dominance, and so on he talks about. Um, okay, that's fine uh, from my point of view, except I would say that um, once you've made sovereignty into a dispositive, then you've deprived it of its defining feature, which is the claim to supreme authority within a particular domain. So it doesn't work as far as that's concerned. And finally, and I touched upon this before, this, um, this is the, the last sort of critical point, that what is driving this history? What is moving this kind of history, uh, this, this kind of meta-narrative? And one possibility is that he kind of discovers critique as this somehow this force um, in particularly that, essay, uh, that lecture at the Sorbonne called What is Critique? The source of, uh, of this kind of move, movement that, so the, the narrative becomes the, uh, this element of critique 
that meets all of these transcendent or quasi-transcendent elements. Theological conceptions of rule, sovereignty, reason of state, familial modes of governing, uh, the welfare state, and each time goes, even discipline, disciplinary institutions, and each time goes beyond them and comes closer to a form of governing that's rooted in the reality that it governs and a form of governing that is closer to self-governing. So there's a kind of teleological driver going on there. So just summing up my four questions and uh, um, governmentality and the governing through freedom, governmentality and other forms of power, governmentality and liberalism, governmentality and the history of uh, power. So these were, I, I guess, the kind of things that lead you to be both, uh, in a way, grasp, celebrate, and uh, think, yes, something creative and innovative came out of this, but at the same time, it's got some really fundamental problems, and we need to go back to the drawing board. So let's start thinking about the kind of distinctions, constitutive distinctions around power. So the, the first one would be between power to and power over. So in the social sciences, to me, it does not make sense to say that we only have productive forms of power and hierarchical power and power over does not, is, is, is not a part of the object. But that seems to be a kind of fundamental assumption of this post-structural uh, approach. So both of those could be seen as Power is capacity, the capacity to achieve something, whether again, whether uh, by on, by oneself or against the will, or in concert with others. And my colleague, late colleague Barry Hindes, pointed out in his book *Discourses of Power* that the two main forms of of thinking about power in, uh, I guess, Western and European traditions are power as capacity, and power as right or legitimate power. Um, so then again, we could think of the, an opposition between legitimate power and perhaps illegitimate power. And questions of expropriation and appropriation would be fundamental there. So I've, my response to, to, to Barry was to say, no, there is a third, if you like, fundamental conception of power. Not just power as capacity and legitimate power, but power as appropriation. Um, so these uh, final one there, power as exercised versus power as possessed. Okay, so we probably don't need to go through this again, but simply to say that the, the um, you know, Foucault is caught up within this same um, set of oppositions, as are many thinkers. And so maybe that's why power is not such a... You know, extremely central concept in the social sciences, um, even though I would argue it should be the central concept. Yeah. So he's got the same these series of oppositions, right? Again, uh, which I, we don't need to go through. So, uh, so, so I ask my. We can miss that as well. So I ask myself: Is it useful to think of power? How, is it, how can we think about power in a way which takes into account these series of oppositions and their relationships? And from the very rich work of Giorgio Agamben that one can take and leave many aspects of, I did take the idea of a signature of power. And by signature, he, he means something, a third term that marks concepts and signs and places them in a particular field. So my, uh, I don't know that I can substantiate this claim, but I would argue that um, it's when power is placed in relationship to uh, uh, power as, as a, the uh, primary sense of power as capacity or potentiality, the ability to do something, I can do something, is placed within this kind of field in relationship to questions of uh, power over in relationship to questions of legitimacy, in relationship to questions of appropriation, then it becomes a political and social concept. Um, 
And the I mean, the second side of this is that it allows movement across different fields. So for a Gambon, it's really the secular and theological uh, domains that are important there. So it's a field. So importantly, it's a field of tension and oscillation. Okay. So now we're getting to the nub of this argument. I think yes, we are. And uh, so let's accept with me for a moment that contemporary forms of power, the two major ways of thinking about power, ones that Foucault has outlined himself, um, are in, in a particular relationship. And by those blue arrows I've tried to uh, capture, um, I apologize for my, my uh, limitations of my representational ability here, um, this idea of a field of oscillation where these two sides can, in a sense, come together, they're in, but they're also in tension between a governmental kind of power and a sovereign kind of power, between an economic managerial power and a jur juridical institutional uh, power. And then if, uh, so as you can see, each of those sides I want to suggest, so perhaps one way of thinking about that opposition would be to think about a practical, humble and mundane, as it was said at the time, ways of governing in an everyday sense, the governmental, and that kind of power which claims some kind of centrality and su su supremacy within a domain, that claims some kind of transcendence. So there's a kind of opposition here between imminent and transcendent uh, uh, forms of power. So looking at the governmental side, we can see where the governmentality framework kind of fits in an analytics of government, a study of the technologies and rationalities of the different ways um, in which conduct is shaped of individuals and collective. So examples there, the job seeker, consumer, and so on. But what I want to say, even within this everyday humble and mundane governing, there's also a kind of foundational side. When you govern in a particular way, you govern for a particular reason, for a set of goals that are related to a particular kind of order. So we want to say on this side of the, of the uh, idea of the signature of power is also a, what I would call a genealogy of order, that each way of governing governs under, uh, it might be globalization would be one idea of a global order uh, that certain kinds of policies and practices governed in relationship to. It might be the order of the market, competitive market. We govern welfare recipients in a particular way because we want to enhance their entrepreneurial characteristics so that they can be competitive in the, in the market, for example. So this idea of a, a, a set of order the other word I've used there, nomos, is the word both uh, Hayek and Schmidt use to describe the kind of, the, the, the type of order that gives rise to what they both consider to be the rule of law, but perhaps rather differently. Um, so again, that we govern in a particular way because the, there are forms of conduct which are somehow uh, learnt in the evolution of this particular order or nomos uh, that have given rise to a particular kind of law. So that's, so that's one side of, the, of that equation. The other side, mirroring the analytics of government, you could talk about an analytics of sovereignty. So we know that different states have different capabilities in terms of taxing, in terms of uh, making laws and enforcing them in terms of public order and security and so on. And these capabilities and capacities of sovereignty are delegated onto all sorts of agents and actors. Um, and without them, you wouldn't have governmentality. I mean, this would be a simple critique of governmentality. Without this taxation system as its condition, there wouldn't be health, welfare, uh, education systems and so on. Okay, so that, that's one. But on the other side, I guess, is, so, um, is, the, is the glory part. And um, 
So how is supreme power, or power that proposes itself to be supreme, constituted? Through what symbols and rituals is it? This, that what are the constitutive acts of legitimation? The con, what is the constitutive power of the people and, and in the formation of this? And I'll talk in a moment, yes, I will get time just to mention archaeology and, 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 and genealogy. I call that archaeology of glory. It is a phrase that, that Agamben himself uses, and we'll come back to that. We'll come back to this slide in a moment. So um, if you haven't quite... Uh... So on both sides, then, there's a kind of map mapping, if you like, of, uh, of this kind of forms or kinds of power relations in which we can see that governmentality is only one. Right? And that um, on each side of the kind of the fundamental equation, you've got a kind of another set of tensions, another field of oscillation going on there. So immediately I asked myself, again, I don't exempt myself from my own self-critical attitude. Um, have I produced a, some kind of hypo stasized, substantialized conception of power here that doesn't have a history, universalized it. And I start to think about all the different ways we can think we have different societies, different uh, discourses, different philosophers and so on have thought about this relationship between this kind of everyday effective power and its foundation and its kind of more transcendent foundation. And we've got a list there, oikos and polis, potestas in the Roman Republic, which lay <clears throat> with the Roman people uh, versus the continuity of authority, of autoritas of, that resided in the Senate, the worldly power of the monarch, the spiritual or ecclesiastical power of the, of the pope, Ernst Kantorovich's um, idea of the king's two bodies, the body natural and the body politic, in constitutional uh, monarchy, we have the parliament and the crown. Um, in uh, Republican discourse, early modern Republican discourse, and indeed in the um, US constitutions, government and the people, we the people are the first words of the US constitution. I know that there's a whole series of, uh, of qualifications of that in the Federalist Papers and so on. Governmentality and sovereignty are just one another version. So what, I'm, what, I'm not, what, I, what is important, I think, to make of that kind of list is that it's not the terms that themselves that's important, but it's the relationship that's important. And it's the historical forms of that relationship that are important. So you can see that the terms actually move. The people might start out as effective power in the Roman Republic, become the transcendent constitutive element of power in the US Constitution. The monarch is the effective worldly power uh, or the, as, as the emperor, the crown becomes, the, becomes this element of continuity and um, supreme authority uh, within uh, constitutional monarchies. Even government switches sides. So in the opposition between civil society and government, you find in things like Thomas Paine's uh, Common Sense pamphlet, he talks about all which is good comes from society and all which is evil comes from government. So this kind of, uh, this kind of moving around suggests that, there, that, uh, that there, it's not a static kind of relationship. Um, my quick... So, but I would say... It's a, a long durée. This is really fundamental to the way in which we think and act in our societies. So it's a part of a long durée. And if I talk about a genealogical temporality, it's really a moving uh, to the future, facing the past, the different forms of order, perhaps. Um, uh, and then uh, the archaeological one, so that, in that sense you could be seen as a progressive series of breaks with the past. Arche the archaeological one is trying to go backwards, um, moving towards the past, 
facing the future and, and if, you look, if you like, looking at the different layers of cultural sedimentation to the point at which there's uh, 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 lack, a lack of distinction, for example, between a theological and political uh, practice. So if I just go back then, that was too quick on that, but if, uh, if I just... So more recently, contextualizing Foucault, but we've also, with um, my PhD student and a number of us at Copenhagen Business School, which might suggest we're still not quite the stereotypical business school, we published in, for Bloomsbury a book on political theology today, 100 years after Carl Schmitt's uh, book. Um, let's just go back to this with that, with, with that those um, uh, issues in mind. I've already hinted at the kind of... Uh, uh, relationship between power concepts and theological ones. Um, and just to think, even in Foucault, for example, the analytics of government focuses on the relationship to this Christian tradition, to, to the pastoral power, to the, um, the techniques that develop, are encased within Western Christian civilization, another phrase that he uses. Uh, quite a number of times, particularly the confession, the avowal, uh, direction of conscience, the development of the uh, of expertise, the genealogy of order. We can look at successive kinds of ordering and ways in which we govern according to certain orders. A key one for me would be the movement from a kind of uh, providential order to a spontaneous order. So for Hayek, for example, he relies on um, he, he, he relies on uh, Ferguson and, and Smith for this, but both of them uh, saw the market order as a kind of act as a result of an act of providence, a, a kind of divine law which had been established, which was going to result in uh, in the best possible outcome. This notion of spontaneous order. If we go to the archaeology of glory, well, I've done some work on oaths and acclamations. So going backwards for these elements of our political practice, whether it's in uh, uh, assemblies or inaugurations or protests, we see these features that often were tr transferred across this division between the theological and the political People in the 1960s, Robert Bella spoke of civil religions, the notion of the, the nation. And finally, the analytics of sovereignty. Key concepts are there that I've just, um, I want to mention, are office, duty, law, decision. Um, I, I'll skip over that and then say you could see these as both, these elements as something like a relationship between an economic theology and a political theology with this proviso that in a Gambon, particularly in a book called The Kingdom and the Glory, he makes these into paradigms. And I think there's not this my point here is that these are not separate paradigms, that there's a kind of these are also a kind of de defining fields of relationships of these power relations. But you could say briefly, this side is in Foucauldian terms is a kind of history of pastoral power. Um, the genealogy of order is the history of notions of oikonomia or economy, which starts out as very much as the management of the household in, with the, with the, in ancient Greece, but de has, a, has a significant detour through the Christian notions of salvation and the management of salvation through the, through the Trinity. Um, we could talk about these institutional practices which we rarely reflect upon and which are fundamental to our politics as a form of liturgical power. So when we, you know, when, when, when we shout at a, uh, 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 a phrase, the people united will never be defeated at a, at a, at a, uh, at a uh, protest or a uh, manifestation, we don't think of that as having certain relationship to particular kinds of uh, 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 praises that come from uh, medieval Christianity and, and, and so on. Similarly with an oath, is this a political or a theological act? Is it a, a juridical 
act? Is it a religious act? What is binding about the notion of an oath? Um, and then on the last one, we could call this ecclesiastical power. This idea, at least partially, the history of the formation of the modern state it has its roots in Roman law, in canon law, the, tra the transfer of Roman law to canon law, to the, uh, the notions of um, office and duty that, that uh, are components of that. So I know I've, I've done that quite quickly. Um, I think we've got about two more minutes and um, I wanted to say only two more things. Um, so I can see that you could be sitting there frustrated, but he's not said anything about resistance. Isn't resistance important? And I have to confess that this has been a kind of constant uh, element in people's responses to anything I've ever said. That I that uh, shouldn't you be thinking about resistance? What about how does resistance happen? And I, I'd say there is no general theory of as there theory of resistance. But there are different kinds of resistances and oppositions and contestations to all of these. So you might say this counterconduct idea, the government of conduct, the idea of, of acting differently within the kind of same space of uh, the, the forms of religious counterconduct that, uh, that Foucault looks at, that give, gave rise to uh, early Protestantism and, uh, uh, and so on. Um, What's counter to a notion of order? So notions of anarchy without foundation, without order, or anomie, normlessness. So some forms of uh, art and expression take the, the, the form of the celebration of anomie uh, and so on. Or even perhaps um, plurality, even a kind of opposition to a, an idea that we live in a unitary order, whether that was globalization or a market order or, or whatever, maybe a pluralization of that is already a kind of form of opposition to it. Um, liturgical power, I would say, well, the counter to liturgical power is a kind of counter liturgical power. It's no longer the kind of shouts of approbation at the presidential election or at the coronation of the new. Uh, the, 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 the new king, um, but it's uh, using the same kind of techniques to, to protest Black Lives Matter and, and so on. Um, so this is a kind of counter uh, politics of that. And then maybe with this kind of sovereignty stuff, you know, we've had the recent uh, uh, and may possibly even future US president uh, accused of sedition, a word which um, is one step up from a dereliction of duty. It's an active undermining of, of sovereignty. Revolution and counter-revolution are still forms of political practice that could be uh, related to this dimension of power. So if, um, just to go back to the trucker's hat and uh, this king reigns but does not govern. So in conclusion, I'm not, um, I said I was offering a kind of analytical framework. If there's a normative element, it's that these, whether you like the way I've tried to represent it or not, uh, that you should, when you're thinking about power and governing, you should think about the kind of issues I've tried to raise and the relationship between them. The relationship between governmentality and sovereignty. The relationship between these kind of liturgical practices in particular that escape our attention and form a kind of constitutive framework of supreme forms of authority and the practical functions of sovereignty and cap capabilities of the state uh, and so on. So there's a trucker's hat with the Latin version of uh, the same thing. So to understand how we govern and are governed to understand power relations more broadly I think we need to attend to the kind of phenomenon that I've just been speaking about and to know where we are on a something like that as a, as a map. It's a very imperfect map. We're, we're, and, what are, and think about the relationships between different forms or different kinds of power relations, different clusters of power relations um, that are located on that map. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitchell. That was very, very stimulating. So we've got about 40 minutes or so for, for questions. Does anybody want to start the ball rolling with the first question? Uh, this phrase you repeat uh, throughout, the king reigns but does not govern. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could give a kind of real-world example of, of that principle in action. Mm. Brexit. So, uh, if you take the idea that the sovereign is something that does not act on um, uh, an every, every day, in, in everyday life, in, in a sense, you have lots of governing going on. Um, but at a certain point, as Richard Tuck, I think, has said, that you have this kind of the sleepy, in these essays, the sleeping sovereign. Somehow it wakes up and in, in this kind of uh, decisive moment and uh, sets a new course of direction, constitutes a new, in a sense, a new political, uh, new polity, a new political formation. So I think this, is a, this could be an element. So both you know, this idea of a sleeping sovereign, um, Schmidt's idea that in normal times, nobody believes there is such a thing as sovereignty. You just, but it's in this exceptional moment that it kind of becomes manifest. And I would say Brexit would be a, a kind of example of that. Thank you, Richard. Very interesting um, presentation. I really enjoyed it. So I have a question about your map or taxonomy, yeah. if I can call. Yeah. So um, you, I, I think you, you presented a very detailed account of the various formats and signatures of power. But I do have a question on, because it, it seems to me that you're approaching um, that, those classifications of power in a very horizontal way. Mm -hmm. Or to put it differently, as if we have one form of power at a time, but what happens when they overlap, or we have certain forms of power over another, or they they are stronger? So how how would you approach the internal hierarchies of power within your map of power? If that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. So um, well, I think if we go back. I'll go back to the last version of this. Um, I think I'm trying to represent this kind of relationship, so I don't know. Um, I would just uh, I, I don't think I would give a perhaps I, it is horizontal, and I wouldn't really give a give a kind of priority. Although I would say that. Sovereign capacities are a condition for anything like a governmentality. That would be the, that would that seems to suggest a hierarchy between between those and and governmentality. Um, in and that's not simply the ta taxation example I gave. It would be a condition for there to be a society in which we are thinking about the conduct of conduct and governing children in a particular way, and so on. Is that we have a relatively high degree of public order and security, and that that's a function of this kind of sovereign capability. So in that, so, so um, then thinking about, uh, I mean, thinking about the, the kind of, the, the sovereignty side of it, thinking about glory, I think it's so, it, this is, this, kind of almost semi-mystical side of sovereignty and this kind of creation of the supreme authority. So there is, a, in a way, a hierarchy there as well. There's, a, there's, a, the, there's some kind of foundational constitutive practices which keep affirming the perpetuity of the crown in the UK, for example, hmm? that uh, somehow makes this system work and makes all the mess of parliament and whatever, and, and bureaucracy and, and public service, civil service, um, uh, 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 kind of work and, and, 
um, or gives it, at least gives it a narrative that it is kind of workable. And, uh, so in that sense, I would say there's a kind of hierarchy there as well. That, uh, so um, on this, yeah. So I think it's really the empirical example that one would choose that one could think about the kind of relations that might exist within that example. Yeah. Um, at the beginning, it was um, interesting. You were talking about how Foucault uh, kind of forgot about freedom. Like he just left it as a receipt. Are you hearing well? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, left it as a residual effect of power. Uh, but finally, I, I thought it was, well, I'm, I'm sure you're a little bit critical of it or it felt like that. But now towards the end, you uh, reflected upon the same thing that kind of seems to have happened to your uh, same analysis. Like freedom just was left a little bit at the end as the reaction uh, with what you were saying with resistance. Uh, so you, you think, uh, you, will that criticism apply to yourself or? Um, I've always been, a, I mean, I might have sounded a bit skeptical of my own, uh, of, of though people who th have thought a lot about power may privilege the side of the relationship, if you like, uh, but I don't think it should be privileged. In that, so in that sense, the analysis of forms of resistance and opposition seems to me to follow from the kinds of power, re power relations that we're talking about. So I don't see that, uh, it might come across in my presentation as residual, but I don't see that as particularly residual, but on but Foucault's own um, thinking around the subject and around freedom seemed to me to go almost full circle. So, you know, from the from uh, discipline and punish, uh, the subject is completely determined by power, is for is 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 created through power, through this kind of thing, to the end where he starts thinking, oh, this is autonomous culture of the self. The Greeks and Romans had something like this. We can learn from it. So he almost has this possibility that the self through technologies of the self creates itself as a work of art or, or, or whatever. So he actually goes through a whole cycle that in lesser thinkers you might say it was totally incoherent. Um, thank you so much for your talk today. It was a really insightful lecture and I just wanted to ask a question following on from the notion of authoritarian versus liberal and this notion of, you know, liberal or neoliberal. Yeah. And I was wondering, on an international scale, so looking at international relations and global governance, how how would you kind of apply the forms of signatures of power in that respect? Because there's so many different states at play and especially when you look at what's going on now in the contemporary world and contemporary governance. Yeah. It's a, uh, certainly a big question. I don't think it's beyond the framework to think about it. I mean, really the relationship between states invokes a very strong uh, notion of of uh, sovereignty and uh, the way in which states behave in, inter in the international domain. Um, the, uh, and there are all sorts of agencies which seek to govern this relationship from the United Nations, uh, WHO, whatever. So you have a whole governmentality around international relations, but at the core of international relations is, a, to me, is this fundamental question of sovereignty and and, uh, and conflict between sovereign states, these leviathans, if you like. Um, but I think you're also asking about this question about liberalism and authoritarianism. And I would say, I don't think we should be so confident to th say that the type of societies, whether it's Australia or where I come from, Denmark or the UK, are somehow um, a special category of advanced liberalism. And we can compare them to various places corrupted by populism, overtaken by authoritarianism, and so on. I think that this is a rather problematic way of thinking. And, and so I just would like to problematize that continu you know, continuum to some extent. I think that's what you're also asking, aren't you? And 
partly yeah. because when looking at the temporary wall and the hidden drivers within that, it seems to be around this application of neoliberalism and liberalism in different states and their different stances in regard to that. So I mean, some of some of them are fueled by trying to protect liberalism, and then some are fueled by the introduction yeah. of liberalism. So it looks, and then when you're looking at global governors that discussion around how have you applied it? You know, you're telling me to do this, but have you done that? So, yeah, it's quite interesting. And then it all kind of filters back down to power. Yeah, so there's another set of power relations going on there. Um, so um, it's not simply that there's this kind of technical, neutral system of governance which can be transported to different territories. That it's a, that there's a hierarchical set of relationships between certain states. There's a and international organisations and and states and regions and territories. Um, so I absolutely agree with what you're saying in that sense. Yeah, uh, it goes a little bit on the same direction as you went. Of um, I'll be more directly on this one. If you do believe that these ideas and standards can be seen as a universal rule. Uh, or they are more settled to fit the Western European governments? Do you believe that all governments can be judged under the same instances? Because we see a lot of discussion about, like she said, uh, about judgment of uh, authority or more libertarian. But just many of the times we, we understand already, we all know about the, the background, the historical background of, of why uh, the whole world has been judged sort of in the same way. And the, the idea they present about Foucault and how we study economic f theology, political theology. If, what is your opinion under this matter? It was quite interesting that we did find, I think we, if you look, at the, we did find that um, we did do chapters on Chinese and Indian political theology in, in, in that book. So there was a kind of attempt to decenter it from this, you know, the Eurocentric. It's often an, it's a kind of easy critique in a way to say, well, these are European concepts and they've somehow been, you're either intellectually imposing them or they've been imposed in a process of colonization. Or, or, or I, it, I think precisely because I think when you look at even the kind of analysis, say authoritarian governmentality that is, has been done in relationship to China, that these prove to be quite in a way, incisive concepts. Uh, there's some very nice stuff that was done on the one-child policy in terms of authoritarian biopolitics and so on. Uh, there's more recent, uh, quite uh, re you know, recent uh, attempts to think really, really around the sovereignty governmentality relationship with the kind of Chinese, uh, the Chinese political order. Um, so in that sense, yes, I can make the critique, but I still think it depends on how useful these concepts might be in a particular context, which, from which they didn't arise in some way. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just wanted to add one or two more thoughts. I really want to comment on that, but then I also have a separate question. Because in terms of international order, what is being criticized is um, that whether the governmental aspect and sovereignty aspect, as you divided them, are uh, merged together or not depends on certain interests. And the COVID pandemic was an example that has often been used in the studies um, or in research, basically saying when it comes to certain economic interests, um, the international um, community would rather go for agreement on international trade and intellectual property. But when it comes to human rights, then there's a lot of flexibility. So these international um, bodies were able to actually implement um, um, implement what they have been, you know, praying in six, like they had in this institution or at the human rights law. So there was a big difference in between on how, or there is always a big difference about how um, powerful the individual institutions are that all define international governance, so to say. Um, there's just a, uh, one aspect, so it really depends on the interest. Um, but another question that I have that I think hasn't been um, touched upon yet. Um, and it's about your thoughts on time and crisis, because um, my observation at least is that I see what I believe is a romanticization of crisis coming up. It doesn't matter what kind of topic we talk about, 
everyone is expecting a crisis. Um, and in one text, I even found someone saying, well, maybe the crisis that is coming will actually enable us to overcome the happenings like these by basically saying it's not capitalism or socialism anymore. It's not colonial and post-colonial anymore. We're going to be so deep in crisis that we actually will be able to um, have a sincere and deep conciliation um, because our grounds are shaken. So I think that these ideas and also fears that come up with crisis approaching any moment have an influence on how people vote, how people uh, perceive power, um, where they, uh, what they trust in, etc. So I would be very interested in your thoughts on that. I was going to say, I think there, there's probably quite a close relationship between this kind of crisis discourse and the sort of invocation of certain types of sovereign capacities. And the, you know, that of course we were in a pandemic crisis and this was going to be a crisis of the health system, therefore we had to act in certain ways and govern ourselves in certain ways. And we had to institute emergency regulations and laws, which, uh, uh, which of course, uh, um, key figures in the government in the UK didn't manage to, to live up to themselves. But uh, so, so in that sense, there is. It seems that I would say a part of the a key part of the discourse of sovereignty is a kind of reliance on notions of crisis for there uh, to be kind of interventions, but. I also just it just occurred to me this phrase about never let a good crisis go to waste, which is also a kind of government governmental uh, uh, imperative. The idea that a, a crisis is the moment at which you make a transformation, at which you introduce I don't know perhaps different kinds of forms of organisation, privatisation of certain services, or, or whatever it, it occurs. So I think there's certainly Certainly, a very we are being worn out by the idea of one more crisis after another, and then we've got the absolute sort of global crisis of the of the idea of the extinction of uh, habitable life within uh, within the planet uh, as a constant kind of apocalyptic uh, reminder. So maybe maybe the kind of emphasis on crisis is also parallels the kind of re-emergence of sovereignty as a form of, of, of a fundamental form of power and particularly in its most extreme kind of manifestations. Mitchell I had a question if that's if that's yeah. all right I wanted to ask so I think you have a very detailed account here of the interactions between these different kinds of power but I wondered whether this is a more kind of sophisticated idea or sophisticated development of the notion that power is this kind of complex assemblage of different kinds of techniques. Because looking at this, this is, this is almost like a complexity theorist dream in the sense that these different uh, forms of power will be interacting in different sorts of ways. Uh, there'll be kind of non-linearities involved here. And so you're actually saying, but in this very detailed way, that we shouldn't think of power as a thing. It's something that's sort of morphing and moving in, in the interactions between these various terms. So. It's not really a question as such, but are you sort of just elaborating on the sort of Foucault's notion that we should see power as this kind of complex assemblage rather than one sort of thing? Um, I think um, I, I do see myself as critical of that idea, critical of notions of complexity in general. Um, and uh, so I'm a very linear thinker in that sense. <laughs> um, but and critical of particularly this post-structuralist sort of revival of these kind of complex networks, you know, uh, that uh, uh, firstly I think there's a kind of uh, you know, there's a kind of religious uh, there's a definitely a theological root to the idea of a dispositive the first uh, dis dispositive or uh, the, uh, the the really elaboration of the dispositive was the Trinity the kind of heterogeneous elements with a strategic salvational direction. Um, so in that sense, I am, I'm kind of skeptical and I can see what you're saying, but I think this is actually, a, I think it's quite, um, I don't know, it's, it, 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 it's quite 
are making quite a strong enunciation that things maybe aren't as complex as we think they are. That that there is a that you know that from our perspective there is this fundamental kind of tension between governmental and sovereign ways of of, of exercising power. Um, of course, these break down into 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 different forms, um, but I don't think that's it's particularly. I mean. It, it may look complex in a kind of representation, but I don't think it's a, like a, a, I'm not imagining it as a kind of organism that's reproducing and subdividing its cells through some. Uh, and and as far as Foucault is concerned, I think that his, his some of his earlier work he he kind of has that fr French you know sensibility about ritual and. Um, to, you know, torture as ritual and, and so on. But, he, but the governmentality stuff loses that. It becomes very kind of secularized in that, in that way. It, it, the kind of symbolics of power drop, seem to me to drop out. And he, he seems to imagine that power is becoming... I know people would reject this idea because they say Foucault is not a philosophy of his, his, historian and he's not really interested in the secularization um, thesis, but it does become more secular and more imminent, and 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 whereas to me, I think you can't really understand populism, the rise of authoritarianism, all of these kind of issues today, the, the forms that protests take, um, unless you understand this liturgical element of power relations, and and I think that that doesn't appear within Foucault. So there are many. Respects, I think there's continuity between this and Foucault, um, and and you know perhaps many that I don't admit to myself. But uh, but but I would say that I, I don't think of this as a complex assemblage. I do think of these as kind of zones that are clearly identifiable. Say the liturgical one is really identifiable by practices, institutional practices. When we um, uh, when we get up in the theatre after a particularly good performance and say, bravo, bravo, and do this, we don't reflect upon this or the affect that that produces collectively when we do that as a, as a ritual that has parallels within the political sphere, within the theological sphere. So, I, yeah, that's a, a brief pricey of some of my thoughts about that, yeah. I'm just wondering, where would you put military on your map? Is it archaeology or analytics of self? Uh, well, I think, I mean, in t um, you would start with the kind of practical side of the military as a form of organization with hierarchy, notions of duty, command, formal authority, and uh, uh, that's uh, useful for sovereign functions such as declaring war, defending territory. So in that sense, it, uh, um, it, it has... I would, lo I would locate it that in, in that sense in the kind of analytics of sovereignty. But of course, it not only has that, it has uniforms, it has uh, flag waving, it has insignias, it has a whole symbolics and, and, and rituals of the military. Um, and then you might think, Okay, what if we decide that we're going to have um, new policies which outlaw sexual harassment in the military? Then you would be talking about um, forms of governmentality in relationship to the military. So I think it's... I, my first place would be to put it in the kind of a fundamental kind of institution of, of sovereign capabilities, but then I would say it has these other... It depends on your empirical study. Yeah. Thank you very much for this really wide-ranging presentation, um, both for the presentation and the critique that this offers us. Picking up on the idea of critique and the last things you were saying about you know, the kinds of tools we need conceptually to understand, say, the rise of populism, I was going to invite you to say a little bit about our own relationship, to historicize our relationship to Foucault and governmentality. So I've been thinking for a while about the ways in which um, it has been clear to me that over time, it's what governmentality and, its, and the analysis of it can do for us at different moments in history has actually kind of changed. 
right? So whether you are one places uh, that concept in the context of a you know post sixty eight France or mm. you know um, yeah. French decolonization on the one hand, mm. or people like me who discovered governmentality through the Foucault effect, because yeah. in the nineteen nineties this seemed like a really important way to think about colonial governmentality mm. and the demand to decolonize because if in fact colonial subjects are formed through this process of governmentality through the conduct of conduct what decolonization looks like mm. is not nearly as straightforward as you know movements of the kind of 50s 60s and 70s might have imagined no. so it did a certain kind of work for us in the yeah. US. 1990s that was really important yeah. that looks very different than the kind of work it starts to do in the wake of the Iraq War, in the wake of the translation into English of the Collège de France lectures. And so I'm wondering, since you have had such a long kind of relationship with Foucault's scholarship, mm -hmm. whether, whether it's worth kind of historicizing what we are asking of this term and how it might look different today mm -hmm. than it looked in the early 2000s or in mm -hmm. the 80s and 90s or, you know, um, like, has it changed over time? If it feels inadequate, does it feel inadequate because our problem space has shifted you know, to kind of produce a kind of historical relationship to the problems that we are asking? If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it makes perfect sense. And in, um, in a way, that's what I think we try to do to some degree, not really in the colonial, post-colonial setting, although we talked quite a lot about his relationship with Iran, in, in the in the in the last man takes LSD book, but it's tried to say here's a thinker who said that there's no such thing as universals, that all concepts are historical. Okay, let's treat these concepts as historical and see how they emerged. What what was the political context in which they emerged? What kind of problems uh, did they emerge in relationship to? And that wasn't the same sort of problems that the Foucault effect initiated. So that's Foucault effect for whatever contingent set of circumstances comes out towards the end of the Thatcher years, but much of that stuff had been published before in, in Ideology and Consciousness. I don't know whether you know that journal. Um, so they'd been, they'd been independently published in, during, the, during the 80s. So this was I guess it's a moment where you've got a very sort of hegemonic ro rollout version of the privatization version of neoliberalism occurring in the UK, the, the, the US. Um, there's a I mean, part of the context is there's a restriction of academic uh, careers in, in certain disciplines. Um, maybe opening up more in business and management disciplines, contracting in places like sociology, for, for example. Um, so, and maybe also a kind of search for, for a critical posture that no longer has those kind of set of references to Marxism and much more traditional uh, uh, forms of, of critical uh, theory, if you like, yeah? So I think that that was the 90s. The 90s also coincide with the kind of end of history, with the idea of there is no alternative. The Tina principle um, that to to uh, that was uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, phrase, um, and so this idea that politics and government would be always about very limited range of options. So. You know, you can analyze governmentality of welfare recipients and decide whether a more market version or a more disciplinary version or a more therapeutic version was better. Um, but you really couldn't contest the kind of uh, structural forces within the economy that produced mass unemployment. So for, that would be an example. So that's the kind of 90s. So as the... as it, uh, the interlocutor at the back pointed out, you know, we're now in crisis fatigue after, say, 20 odd years after that. So I think we're in a very different position. The, certainly, the, there is no, in terms of world order, 
there's very uh, it's it's a very fragile situation that we're in in terms of uh, the ability for uh, for there to be a kind of he hegemon in terms of the world order. Um, so there are a lot of critical challenges which don't which go beyond. Can we have a what we call a let called a in the, in the Last Man book, we called a left governmentality. Could there be a left governmentality that married neoliberal policies with, with social democracy or something like that? I think we've gone beyond that. So it's a very, and this is a, these historical contexts change very kind of, to me, to me, have changed very quickly and fundamentally across this period of time. Uh, do you have any more questions? No. Well, I think um, Mitchell's given us an awful lot of food for thought, and I think you've done your best to give him a working over as well. So um, I just want to thank you all for coming this evening. Um, before we close, I'd like to let you know about uh, an event we have actually tomorrow evening. So if you've got an appetite for more discussion, we have Jamanda Gim Menica uh, Becchio from the University of Turin. She's going to be speaking to us on gender and power in the history of economics, feminist economics versus standard economics in marriage theory. Uh, so that's tomorrow evening at 6.15 if you're interested in that. But for now, all I'd like to do is to thank you again for coming and especially a massive thanks to our guest of honour, Professor Mitchell Dean. Mitchell, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>